Good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you very much. Sorry for the, the slight technical complication in there. Um, uh, our apologies in that we we had hoped the um, that our, our researcher Michal Butler would be there in person to present this paper today, but Michal's unwell at the moment, um, and I found out at ten o'clock in the morning that I would be having the job of of giving this paper. So. Um, what we want to do is tell you a little bit about some ongoing work trying to identify, trying to better understand and trying to think about how we manage and deal with hunter-gatherer archaeology high up in the Cairngorm Mountains. And in particular, there's two new and ongoing projects here which we, which we want to introduce to you. The first is a project called Looking Up which runs from 2021 to 2023 with funding from the Irish Research Council. Um, and this really is focused on how improving the ways we can identify Mesolithic sites and improving the ways we can manage Mesolithic sites in these landscapes. And the second is ongoing excavation work um, funded by, primarily funded by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland at Score and Owen. Um, a, a site we've been trying to work at for some time and we've, it seems to be one of the most cursed archaeological sites in the world. But I'll, I'll say something about that in, in due course, but we're, we've started work on that site and we have another really interesting upland Mesolithic site. Just in terms of, of context and one of the things that's, that, that's driving my interest in this material is a, is a broader reflection on the place of mountains in the Mesolithic of Europe. Europe is in many ways a, a continent defined by mountains. This is um, citations from a, a survey undertaken on behalf of the EC by a group called Nordrigio. And they highlight that mountain municipalities, and these are areas, um, parishes, where uh, greater than 50% of the land is a mountain. This covers over 40% of the European landmass, and nearly 20% of the European population live in what can be defined as mountains. So clearly, Europe is a is a mountainous continent. We know from across Europe that Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were using mountain landscapes, and they often seem to be using them quite extensively. So if we're to, if we're to understand the Mesolithic of Europe properly, we really have to deal with and engage with the Mesolithic in mountain environments. It's a key part of the story of the period. And I could, I could speak about this for, for much, much longer. I'll, I'll spare you that at the moment, but just that some of these reflections on the, on the nature of the Mesolithic of mountain environments in Europe are in an open access paper um, called Mesolithic Montology, where I get to um, talk about Mesolithic archaeology, mountain running, and Nan Shepard's wonderful writings about the, about the Cairngorms. I, I think I described it as having reached peak me um, at one point. Mountains are also enormously dynamic landscapes. It's easy to think of mountains as somehow timeless and stable, but mountains are undergoing change from a whole variety of different processes. This includes climate change, it includes economic development, partly around things like hydro and wind schemes, but actually significant changes in tourism as well. So there are many, many drivers of change. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 15.4 is looking at the conservation of mountain ecosystems. And it's interesting to note here that their indicator of success in this is a green cover index. It's effectively keeping the numbers of, of um, forested environments in place in these mountain landscapes. But clearly that in some instances involves planting forests, which again has potentially archeological implications. These debates play out closer to home as well. And in terms of the Cairngorms itself, we're already seeing the impact of climate change here in terms of snow cover. And that has knock on impacts in terms of tourism, particularly the winter skiing industry and people then diversifying into new forms of tourism. And the, the excellent book by Andrew Painting, Regeneration, the Rescue of a Wild Land. Um, this is uh, an account of varied rewilding projects within the Cairngorms themselves. Rewilding, again, we could have an enormous discussion around this, but rewilding often involving things like peatland restoration or the regeneration of woodland, again, which has significant archaeological impacts. So you have these mountain landscapes with hunter-gatherer sites in there. You have these dynamic changing landscapes, which raises real issues about how best to manage those landscapes. And this is 
made even more striking by the difficulty of finding and identifying sites in these landscapes. So this is our older work here. This is excavations on the northern side of Geldy Burn. And just a very simple zoom on this slide, the, the final blue box on the right hand side, the very small dots you can see there are our students diligently excavating. This is a tiny site in a really very, very big landscape, which is substantively covered by peat. So actually finding sites is significantly difficult. OK, just a little bit of uh, context more specifically about why the Cairngorms and where these new projects are focusing on. Well, we've been working in the Cairngorms um, since approximately 2013, initially with the Upper Dee Tributaries project, collaborations between University College Dublin, University of Aberdeen, University of Stirling and others, um, excavations at Kakan and Ruhr, that's the yellow circle on the left here, excavate, uh, by UCD, excavations by Aberdeen um, at Chest of Dee, that's the circle to the right here, and lots of that material um, has been published, at least in, in part, if not fully. The two projects I'm going to talk about today are shifting the focus um, a little bit. The excavations at Score and Owen are a little bit further up Glen D itself, and looking up really seeks to focus on the high mountains itself, and particularly this summer work on the Cairngorm Plateau proper. So start with um, looking up. This is funded by IRC Coalesce funding. This is a, a, a slightly unusual funding stream in that it, it must partner arts, humanities or social sciences with hard sciences. So the, my co-lead on this, Sam Kelly, is from UCD Earth Science. It also, although it funds research, it only funds research where that directly contributes to real world issues and sometimes the development of policy overall. So Sam and I put together a, a proposal to try and better understand the late glacial and early Holocene landscapes of the Cairngorms, to try and find ways of predicting archaeological sites, and to make sure that that contributed to better practice in terms of the management and preservation of these landscapes. Um, and the so within the last glacial maximum, when this area was covered by ice, you have no hunter-gatherers present. In the interstadial 14,000 years ago or so, we have hunter-gatherers further down in the D itself, but not known in the Cairngorm at this time. Cold period of the Younger Dryas settlement retreats again. And by the time we get into the Holocene, we have Mesolithic hunter-gatherers on the fringes of the Cairngorms, in the valleys of the Cairngorms, but nothing on the high plateau. So the aims, as I just said, we want to generate this new data about the late glacial and early Holocene heritage in these mountain landscapes. We're going to use archaeological and geological data to construct predictive models, show some of those in just a moment, and use this to contribute to the development of policy for these highland landscapes overall. So first of all, I must thank our project panel. Um, we have a panel comprised of a wide variety of stakeholders and check in with them um, every three months. And that's been absolutely invaluable in terms of this project, in terms of helping really guide and drive the direction that we're taking the project in. And I think the, the meetings we've had have been very, very um, useful, very, very grateful to all the participants in those panels. And I think hopefully there's something quite nice and collaborative in the way that that panel operates and allows people who are there on the ground to help guide the research that we're doing. In terms of the work itself in, on the glacial side of it, this is Sam, um, Sam is leading this part of it. We're obtaining new dating samples um, for cosmogenic exposure um, data, beryllium and um, carbon-14 caught up in quartz of all things actually, to get better understandings of the timing of the retreat of ice at the late glacial and the early Holocene. So we get a better sense of when different parts of the landscape were potentially becoming available for settlement. There's a lot of work been done on this in the Cairngorm, but there's still potential for refine. And we're drawing on lots of that really high quality work, which has been done before, but we're able to refine aspects of those and hopefully nuance part of that understanding. And these are just one of the sample sites we were working at um, last summer. These are long walks in to get to these places and very rewarding places to work. One of the one of the great things about this project is we get to spend time in some really, really nice places. As well as providing new dating evidence, um, Alice Doughty at the University of Maine is providing um, numerical quantified models 
of the spread of ice across the Cairngorms. So she uses a variety of modern climate proxies overall to try and, and for an iterative process, try and understand how ice accumulates if you drop temperature or you drop pre precipitation by certain amounts. We're still in the early stages of these, but we'll be tying the results of Alice's models of the um, precipitation and ice overall to the dating that we have to be able to make hopefully a really nice dynamic model of changing ice conditions in the area. As well as that, we're using a more traditional archaeological predictive modeling, and this will be integrated with that stuff about the ice um, to, to, to bring those things together. And, and we're using a variety of proxy landscapes. We, we don't have enough data in the Cairngorm at the moment to generate robust predictions about where other sites might be. So we're using other landscapes to try and give us a, a sense of this. Um, this will include material from the Alps. It will include material from the Norwegian Highlands. The first ones that Michal, who's been leading this part of the project, has been working on is taking the North York Moors and the Pennines. We're not saying that these landscapes are the same as the Cairngorms. We're saying that they are upland landscapes in Britain with something of the shared Mesolithic tradition. They are indicating something of the sorts of choices people are making about the use of upland environments. And maybe this gives us a hook to work on in looking in these big, big mountain landscape spaces of the Cairngorms. And Michal's been looking at a variety of aspects. So this is the North York Moors, elevation, slope, distance from water, um, aspect, and using that to develop predictive models about where sites might be located. So this, for example, sorry, that's taking a moment to, this, for example, is um, a predictive model. The shading here is indicating the likelihood of finding Mesolithic sites based on the location information that we have from Mesolithic sites. So the red is showing areas where it's considered most likely that we would have Mesolithic sites. As you would expect, most Mesolithic sites have been found in those areas, but it's interesting to note that down in the southwest of this map, for example, there's areas of what look like significant potential for Mesolithic sites where none has been found yet. We need to continue to develop these models and apply them to the Cairngorm landscape. The second part of this modeling will be um, agent based modeling and trying to understand the potential movement of both humans and animals through this landscape and thinking about the movement of animals um, as a potential proxy for human activity. Um, in these areas. And this, we, we hope, will allow us to further refine some of these predictions about where sites might be. And it's important to note in this, and we, we recognize from the start that the timescale on which this project runs is a 24 month project. We know that our ability to ground truth these models is going to be very, very limited. We have two short periods of field work, um, but we're going to be limited to surface survey. We can't go out and do extensive test pitting, for example, to test our predictions overall. So the, the, the model will need to be generated and then tested uh, over time um, because it will take time to generate that much material. We're doing a lot of outreach and engagement and trying to raise awareness of these mountain landscapes. Um, much as I wish I lived in the Cairngorm Mountains and could access there every day, I live just south of Dublin. I come and visit for a few short periods of time. The people who are most likely to find this material are those who live and work and, and, and play in these areas, the hill walkers, the mountain runners, the climbers, all of those sorts of people. So we're trying very hard to raise awareness, and this has been building on the work we've done before. Um, we've been working with um, Digit and, and others to, to try and spread the, spread the news. This is Mountaineering Scotland magazine with the awfully titled Early Man in the Cairngorms um, article. I was furious when I saw the title that they'd actually given to this, but it's trying to get that story out into the mountaineering community. Um, and we, as part of Looking Up itself, we have um, uh, funding in place for art installations and performance working with Cairngorm National Park Authority. And we've, um, uh, Richard Skelton is going to be providing these. And, and Richard, if you don't know his work, um, he's really well placed to be the right person for this. His PhD thesis was a book length poem about upper Paleolithic hunter gatherers um, returning to the British landscape and that stranger in the mask of a deer here. He's, a, he's an artist who works across many media. And at the top right here, the last glacial maximum um, is a CD he released a couple of years back, um, inspired by the uh, what the landscape of Britain must have been like at the last glacial maximum. So Richard has a very distinctive way of thinking about these landscapes. But this, this outreach and engagement is really important. 
In terms of the, the second project that's ongoing at the moment, Score and Owen. Score and Owen, we identified in 2015 during the last fieldwork season of the um, Upper D Tributaries project, a small group of students um, looking in an erosive context adjacent to a footpath, found a very small number of artifacts. We returned on a somewhat less pleasant day in 2016. We've ended up with at that stage a total of 15 artifacts and really non diagnostic to, to period. And we um, at, at that point uh, knew that it was this was a site that we wanted to, to go back to at different times. Um, in 2019, we um, received funding from Society of Antiquaries of Scotland to do this field work, discovered about a month and a half before the field work was due to start that peregrine falcons were nesting on the cliffs above the site, so we weren't able to access the site that year. We had money again from the Society in 2020 to do field work, but something happened in 2020 that made it difficult to travel internationally and carry out field work, and it was only 2021 when we were able to start the work there. It's a really striking location. This is a high lake glacial river terrace now somewhere in the region of 20 meters above the Dee itself at a notable pinch point in the valley. So the Dee is flowing from the right to the left as you look in this photo here. And the, the small blue lump you can see is our, is our site shelter, um, a small tent. But this very, very notable large flat terrace. We were working, um, excavating, sorry, apologies. Something strange has happened there. Sorry, something. Okay, apologies for that. We were excavating um, test pits this year to try and determine the um, scale and extent of the scatter around this um, erosion caused by this small water water course. Excavated approximately 30 test pits in total, a metre by a half metre or a metre by a metre. Very, very um, heavily podcelized soils under a thin peat, which makes identifying features quite challenging, although we did identify what we think is one small pit. We um, identified quite a notable concentration of lithics. The lithic scatter itself is really quite um, tight, most of it coming out from probably only one or two test pits, a few more in the um, erosion overall, but this scatter is probably five meters by five meters at the very most overall. Um, we've now got a total of, I think it's 46 artifacts from the, from the site. So this is again, a very low density, tightly clustered um, uh, flint scatter and a couple of pieces, including the one at the bottom left here, which this is a, it doesn't show brilliantly in the photo, but this is a microburin. So this is um, clearly and diagnostically late mesolithic. We haven't got any material at this stage we think is suitable for radiocarbon dating. There's a lot of charcoal kicking around in the subsoils here, but none that we've been able to confidently associate with any archaeological features. And clearly, Caledonian pine forests will burn on occasion. The intention is to come back um, this September and uh, undertake an open area excavation on the southern side of the watercourse here and see if we can generate, um, see if we can recover more artifactual material, more structural evidence, hopefully, and potentially dating evidence for that. In 2022, then, we have um, a, a couple of reasons to be coming back into the Cairngorms um, itself and doing field work. The, it, so it, this July, we're doing field work on the high plateau of the Cairngorms itself. This is us testing a vaguely crazy idea I had, but um, most people seem to suggest that there's some logic in it. And this is that there are areas on the Cairngorm plateau which have quite long lasting snow, particular areas where the snow lasts until quite often into, into the early summer. And that these locations are important ecotones. Animals congregate at these sites. To, um, there's, a, there's a source of water, there's relief from the insects, it's a little bit cooler overall. And if you look elsewhere in Scandinavia, for example, these types of ice patches have been very, very important hunting sites. So our hypothesis is that these locations um, exist in the Cairngorms. They should be useful eco zones for animals to congregate, that therefore they may be interesting places for people to go and target for hunting. And that therefore one way of narrowing down the area of search on top of the Cairngorms is to, is to use this as a way of looking for and trying to identify prehistoric activity. And, and if it doesn't work, then we get to spend two weeks walking around the top of the Cairngorms, which isn't such a bad thing to do either. In July 2023, we'll be back for two more weeks of survey trying to test the predictions of the, of the archaeological um, models, 
don't know exactly where that will be at the moment until the models come in with their prediction. And as I say, in September this year, we'll be working at SCORE and Ellen, um, hopefully collaborating with Meso D side. It's worth just emphasizing here, we, we take the landscapes we're working in very seriously. Some of the survey sites we have on the high plateau are immediately um, adjacent to the site of the 1971 Cairngorm Plateau disaster, the worst mountaineering accident ever to happen in Britain and Ireland. So we've built mountain skills training into our program. So um, myself and Sam have recently advanced mountain skills training and we'll have mountain leadership training. All of the students are being asked to undertake mountain skills training and we all have mountain first aid as well. This is the students on their mountain skills training. Uh, you, you may or may not believe this, but there are actually four students in the orange emergency shelter in there. And we're just trying to make sure that if the weather or anything changes up on these hills, we can we can get everyone back safely, because that's far more important than any archaeology that we might identify. Okay, that hopefully gives you a sense of a couple of ongoing projects. Hopefully you have not been so bored that you're also now scattered all over the floor sleeping like the students were at the end of our excavation last year. Very grateful to, to lots of people who have supported and funded this research. Thank you very much for your attention today.